Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Welcome uh, to, back to our Ramadan Halakha series on Islamic Theology 101 uh, with Dr. Firyal Salim. Um, inshallah, today's session is going to cover uh, a topic of particular interest uh, to myself and I know uh, so many others in the space uh, for monotheism and divine and the divine attributes. Uh, so my name is Osama. Uh, I serve as the resident chaplain uh, here at uh, Muslim Space, a organization that is based in Austin, Texas, uh, and grounded in the values of uh, being an open and inclusive and diverse community for all self-identifying Muslims, as well as any uh, allies and non-Muslims. And uh, despite the fact that we're based in Austin, Texas, uh, our uh, programs are for people from across uh, the country and across the world, um, as evidenced by uh, Dr. Salem joining us from uh, her home in Chicago, uh, our uh, executive director, Shadia, being in Iowa, we're, we're all over the place, uh, but we, we, we like to keep it that way. Uh, and uh, Dr. Salem uh, needs no further introduction. Alhamdulillah, I will uh, provide a, um, a, a link to her bio in the chat. Uh, mashallah, her resume is very accomplished and um, Shadia did a great job in, in detailing it. But uh, just to preface, Dr. Salem is serving as uh, the Associate Pre Professor uh, of Arabic and Islamic Studies and the Director of uh, the Master of Divinity in Islamic Studies and Muslim chaplaincy programs at uh, American Islamic College or AIC uh, in Chicago. Um, so Dr. Salem, welcome back. And uh, without further ado, I'd love to have you take it away, just the structure of the program. We'll have Dr. Salem uh, present uh, and give her presentation. And then just like last time, inshallah, we'll open it up for a moderated conversation and question and answer. So at any point uh, during the uh, event, please, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to just put them in the chat. You can message them to myself or to Shadia, um, or uh, at the end of the time when the Q&A session is there, you can just raise your hand uh, and we'll, we'll call on you. But uh, inshallah, without further ado, let us welcome uh, Dr. Salem back uh, to the stage and to the space. Welcome back, Dr. Salem. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Thank you so much for having me. Today, I'm so excited to speak with all of you. Um, this is our second session on uh, theology. I hope everybody can see me all right. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Okay, great. Let's see. This is my presentation. And okay. All right. Can everyone see that all right? Yes, all right. So um, this was, um, today we're gonna be talking about the divine attributes and monotheism. Uh, as you all know, uh, the shahad, the testification of faith is the first pillar of uh, Islamic practice. So uh, this first pillar of Islam saying the Shahada testifying that God is one and testifying that uh, Muhammad is the messenger of God. Um, these two uh, beliefs and um, outwardly expressing these beliefs is the way in which a person would convert to Islam or enter Islam. And this is considered the first of the five pillars and this pillar then makes all the other uh, pillars obligatory. So once one is a Muslim, then fasting Ramadan, praying the five prayers, going on Hajj and giving zakat become obligatory on the individual. So the uh, first and foremost part of this testification is that there is no God but God. And theology, uh, and Muhammad is the messenger of God and that goes under Nubuwat, but theology and monotheism is really uh, today's section, we're going to be looking at this first part of the Shahada, La ilaha illallah. What does that actually mean? So um, I'm going to start off uh, from a basic foundation and build up uh, to something that's a, a bit more sophisticated by the end. But um, some basic foundations, let's look at verses from the Quran, how they describe God. This is one of the well-known um, verses, uh, Ayat al-Kursi, Allahu la ilaha illa huwa al-hayyul qayyum, la ta'akhuduhu sinatun wa la nawm, lahu ma fi samawati wa ma fi al-ard, man dhe ladhi yashfa'indahu illa bi-idhni, ya'alamu ma bayna aydihim wa ma khalfahum, wa la yuhaytuna bi-shay'in min ilmihi illa bi-ma sha'a, 
وسع كرسيه السماوات والأرض ولا يؤده حفظهما وهو العلي العظيم So it begins by saying Allah, God, there is no deity but him and it describes God as the ever living, the sustainer of all existence um, he doesn't. He is not overtaken by sleep, so he did not rest on day number seven. That's not a uh, Muslim theological position on that. Um, to him belongs whatever is in the heavens and whatever is in the earth. Who is it that can intercede with him except by God's permission? He knows what is presently before them and what will be after them, and they encompass not a thing of his knowledge except for what God wills. His kursi, his throne, extends over and the earth, and their preservation tires him not. And he is the most high and the most great. So we see um, this is one of the um, uh, key verses in the Quran that really highlight some of uh, what, what are the attributes of God. And we're going to see this again in a more systematic fashion. Uh, we also see uh, the Surah Al Ikhlas. Uh, as you all know, this is a, um, a short surah that everybody from their childhood, all Muslims from the time they're young, uh, is probably a hyperbole, but pretty much most Muslims since they're little, if they memorize a surah, this will be the surah that they'll memorize. Qul huwa Allahu ahad, say God is one. Allahu samad, he is the eternal refuge. Um, he neither begets nor is born. Another similar verse we see وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِي إِذَا دَعَانْ فَلْيَسْتَجِيبُ لِي وَلْيُؤْمِنُوا بِي لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْشُدُونَ um, I forgot to put in the translation here. What this means is, and if my servant calls upon me, I am near, فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِي I answer the prayers or the supplications or of the one who is calling when they call upon me, إِذَا دَعَانْ فَلْيَسْتَجِيبُ لِي وَلْيُؤْمِنُوا بِي لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْشُدُونَ So let them answer to me or turn to me and believe in me so that they may be rightly guided. So what does all of this mean? <clears throat> We see that uh, within these verses, and we see that when Muslims have looked at uh, parts of the Quran theologically, they've uh, encountered or they've come up with a number of ways of describing God. Um, so one of them is God's attributes. So when these attributes are systematically uh, outlined, it has helped Muslims understand or crystallize in their own minds what does it mean when Muslims say they believe in God? What is God? What is God to Muslims? So um, the attributes of perfection and flawlessness are considered necessary attributes of God. In other words, anything that entails imperfection and flaws is impossible to be associated with God. And we're gonna go over this in detail in a minute. Um, there are 13 attributes of God according to the Ash'aris and 14 according to the Maturidis. Uh, all of the attributes overlap for both of these uh, Sunni theological schools, except for the attribute of Tekwin, which is bringing into existence, which the Maturidis consider as a uh, separate attribute. So the attributes of into uh, categories. The first are those pertaining to God's self, nafsiyah. Uh, the second are negating attributes, salbiyah. And the third are attributes of affirmative meaning. And these are known as sifat al-ma'ani. Um, additionally, we see that the 99 names, these are active descriptions of God, some of which overlap uh, with the uh, attributes we're going to look at. But these are names that describe God's actions, so fa'aliyah, uh, such as al-basir, the living, the willing, murid, uh, mutakallim, the almighty, etc. Uh, most theologians do not separate these out into attributes or sifat, and we will uh, discuss this in further detail towards the end. 
So the first attribute of God is the attribute of God's own essence. And this is al-wujud. This is al-sifat and nafsiyah. His existence is considered one and the same with his essence. Um, God is the necessary existent, wajib al-wujud, without cause or prior process. This means that there is no cause or process that brought God into existence. He is the uncaused cause. He's the unmoved mover. And this is the rational argument that you'll find in text, the theology texts for the existence of God. Now, if you look at Islamic theological texts of Kalam, you'll see that they begin with rational arguments for the existence of God before um, looking at uh, verses from the Quran and things like that, because the, um, the reasoning is, is that uh, if people don't believe in God in the first place, they're not going to take a, a citation from the Quran as definitive because they don't believe in God and they don't believe that the Quran is the word of God. And so if you come to them saying, hey, look, God exists here, this is what it says in the Quran, that's not going to be persuasive outside of a select circle of individuals who all believe uh, in, a, in a way that's similar to the person who's making the argument. And so for this reason, books of Kalam begin with rational arguments for the existence of God first. And this argument uh, that uh, Muslims have used for centuries is this idea of al-wajib al-wujud. Uh, we, we also find scriptural support. So you'll see that I'll be referring to rational evidence and scriptural evidence. So the Quran itself says that God is the creator of all things and he is over all things and he is the disposer of affairs. So what does this concept of wajib al-wujud mean? Now, um, this is my screen here. Let's see if I can. Um, so, boy, I can't move this either, huh? Oh, here it is. Okay. So it begins with this following argument here. So all things come from a cause that brings existence into being. So everything that exists, exists because something brought it into existence. There's nothing that appeared out of the blue without something bringing, in, bringing it into existence, whether it's this pencil, whether it's this phone, whatever it is, there's something there's another cause that brought this existence into existence. So the existence of a thing indicates that there's something else that exists prior to it that brought that thing into existence. Um, but the issue with this is that if, we're, if we agree that everything that exists has another cause that brought it into existence, this can't go on forever because this would then mean that uh, we're going into infinite regress, which is a logical impossibility. Um, an infinite regress of causes would mean that there is no cause that would start a infinite or finite progression of causes. So um, for things to uh, uh, cause other things, there has to be one cause where everything begins to begin with. And that one first cause is one that is not caused by anything else. And we'll look at a little bit of the vocabulary that's used here. So rationally, there must be one uncaused cause and one existent that is not contingent upon the existence of another existence. So you see this word contingent in Arabic mumkin is used a lot. And this is in contrast to wajib. So contingent, when we say something is contingent, we'll say, the, um, the event is contingent upon, or this picnic is contingent upon uh, the weather, for instance. So when we say something is contingent, it is dependent upon another existent to exist itself. So um, everything world uh, is considered to be contingent. It's, ex it's dependent, it's a cause, Thing that is dependent upon another cause to exist in and of itself until there is that one cause that is not dependent on any other cause 
to exist in and of itself. So its existence is a necessary existence as opposed to a contingent existence. This is what's known as wajib, necessary. So the existent is necessary to uh, start the infinite or finite progression of existence and causes. If a necessary existent, wajib al wujud, so this is, it's necessary that a non cause causer exists. This is wajib al wujud. If a necessary existent did not exist, then nothing else whose existence is contingent could exist either. Um, the necessary existent, wajib al wujud, which causes every other cause, is God. And um, we see this in the contemporary period. If you Google the Kalam cosmological argument, it's interesting that uh, many Christians have also adopted this argument. Now, in case this is confusing, I will illustrate the wajib al wujud argument for all of you here. Okay. So, so existence number one. You'll ask, well, what brought that into existence? Well, it was brought into existence by existence number two, the second thing that exists. Okay, well, what brought that into existence? Existence number three. Okay, great. So what brought that into existence? Existence number four. What brought that into existence? Existence number five, what brought that into existence? So as you see, this can keep going forever. This is what's known as infinite regress. And for this to keep going forever is a logical fallacy because for this to start somewhere, for existence number one to exist, there has to be an existence where it all stops. So the buck stops at the wajib and wujud the necessary existence, wajib and wujud, which is God. So the existence of the one existent that is not neat, dependent on anything else to exist makes it possible for existence number five, existence number four, existence number three, existence number two, and existence number one to exist. Without um, one, without an unmoved mover, without a uh, existence that is not dependent on anything else to exist, none of the other contingent existences would exist in the world, not the, not the, uh, not the earth, not the sky, none of these things. So this is the argument for God's existence in Islamic theology known as wajib and wujud, and it's the first um, attribute of God. It's known as the attribute of God's essence, which is God's existence, and God's existence is one with his essence. So this um, from the Sifat and Nafsiya, Wujud, existence. Now we move on to the negating attributes. These are known as Sifat as salbiya the first is al qidam and this is beginninglessness. So he has no beginning. God is the first with no beginning, and he is the last with no end. So there was no beginning to God's existence. He was there when nothing else existed. So you see how this argument really sets the ground for much of what's going to come afterwards, this, uh, this uh, argument of necessary existence. So um, if God is a necessary existence, that means he didn't have a beginning. God is the first, al-awwal, with no beginning. He is al-akhir, with no end. These are also one of the 99 names of God. There was no beginning to God's existence. He was there when nothing else existed. His being is not preceded by non-existence. God created time, therefore exists before time exists. Therefore, God cannot be limited by time. God is beyond time and space. Um, had he been created, that entity which created God would have, be, would have to be either created or without beginning. This goes on until we reach infinite regression. Therefore, God is that one place, that one thing that is uncreated and without beginning. And um, this is also... Uh, 
where we say that God is eternal and azali. So he is without beginning. He is without beginning and without end. Uh, we see this in the Quran, huwa al-awwalu wal-akhiru wal-zahiru wal-batinu wa huwa bi kulli shay'in alim. He is the first and the last, the outward and the inward, or the evident and the imminent, and he has full knowledge of all things. The third negating attribute is uh, endlessness or everlastingness. This is uh, al-baqa. So God's existence also has no end. Just as it has no beginning, it has no end. The rational evidence of this is, had it been possible for God to perish, then it would follow that it would be possible for God to be uh, created or have a beginning like other creation. So if God can't have a beginning, then rationally, logically, God also can't have an end. Um, it has been established that he is the necessary existent. He's al-wajib al-wujud, and therefore without a beginning. That which must exist by necessity cannot cease to exist at any time. So if God's existence, wujud, is necessary, it's, it exists by necessity, uh, it's not contingent upon anything else, then uh, it cannot then also have an end. All else exists at the will of God and can cease to exist at the will of God. So all of the other things, so remember this, all of these other one, two, three, four, five are dependent upon God to exist and cease to exist at any moment through the uh, of God. But God, his existence is not dependent upon anyone else's existence. Um, we also see this reference in the Quran. كل من عليها فان ويبقى وجه ربك ذو الجلال والإكرام. So all that is on earth will perish, but will abide for forever. The face of thy Lord, full of majesty, bounty, and honor. So we see this term from the same attributes, the negating attribute of al-baqa. Um, interestingly, if you look at the way Islam has been practiced over centuries, you'll see that this is one of the names of God, al-baqi, that um, uh, or attributes of God that people will put on their tombstone. Who al-baqi? So everything else, all is mortal and has an end, except for God who does not have an end. Another attribute of God is that he is unlike his creation. So mukhalafatil hawadis. Mukhalafatil hawadis. So God is unlike creation in any aspect. So he is not a uh, he's not like creation in his essence, not in his attributes, not in his actions. Uh, Ghazali sa says in his Iljam al Awam, if one believes in his mind that God is a body made up of parts or limbs, then he is a worshiper of idols, for every form and body is created. And the worship of idols is disbelief since they are created. Whoever worships a body is a disbeliever by consensus of the Muslims. If that body is dense or solid like a mountain or thin like the air or water, and regardless if it radiates like the sun and the moon or like the ground. So um, he is unlike, God is unlike his creation in any way. We also see Imam Abu Hanifa in his Fiqh al-Akbar comments on the saying, God is a thing, a shape unlike any other things. And the meaning of God as a thing, unlike any other, is that we affirm his existence without body, substance, accident, myth, or counterpart. Uh, Ghazali in his Ihya says he is without body and form, free from restriction, limitation, and resemblance, and is not divisible. Nothing is like him, and he is not like anything. He is not limited by measure, space, and time, he is free from rest and change, and everything is in God's grasp. Now, let's look at the Quranic verse that says this. <laughs> 
um, he is the creator of the heavens and the earth. He has made you for he has made for you pairs from among yourselves, among cattle. By this means, uh, he multiply you there. There is nothing whatever like. So this is the part that we're looking at here. We're focusing on. So nothing is like God. So based on this description in the Quran is this negating attribute. Mukhalafa lil hawadis. He is unlike his creation. And this is what the Quran says of God. He is unlike his creation. Another negating attribute is qiyam bi nafsihi, so subsistence. God is not in need of anything else in order to exist. He is al ghani, which means the one who is absolutely free from need. All depend on God to exist, and God depends on no one. Remember this, we're going to keep referring to this, right? So this is God's existence. All depend on God to exist. God depends on no one. So he is uh, subsistent. All depend on God to exist, but God depends on no one. The rational argument for this is, if God had been dependent on others, he would have been originated. He would be contingent, similar to creation, similar to everything else in the world. He would have, he would have been caused. This means that God's power would be limited through his need for another power. One who is in need of his creation cannot be the source of his creation. So if God were to be in need of all of the other things that exist, God cannot be the source of its existence. And we talked about wajib and wujud. It's been established that he is the necessary existent without beginning in order for creation to exist. And we see the verse from the Quran. Ya ayyuhan nasu antum al-fuqara'u ila Allah wallahu huwa al-ghani al-hamid. It is you that have need of God, but God is the one free of worthy of all praise. So God, everybody needs God, but God is free of all wants. He is al-ghani, so he is not in need of anyone else. And um, the sixth negating attribute is al-wahdaniya. So oneness is the negation of multiplicity in describing God, whether that is in regards to his essence, attributes, sifats, and actions. Uh, God has no partner in his essence, no partner in his attributes, and no partner in his actions. He is transcendent of having opposites or relations such as a spouse, children, and parents. Oneness is the negation of multiplicity, plurality, and divisibility. His essence is not composed of parts or elements. The rational argument for this is uh, the harmony that one sees and precision verse reflects one divine source for all of these caused things. Uh, had there been a plurality of gods, there would have been differences among them that would manifest in chaos on the ground rather than um, harmony. Uh, from the Quran, we see the Quran says, Qul huwa Allahu ahad, say God is one. And from this is the attribute of wahdaniyah, God's oneness. So now we move into the affirmative attributes, sifat al-ma'ani. Uh, the first affirmative attribute is power. So power is attribute of God's essence. Qa'im be that. So it is attribute that um, uh, that comes about through God's essence. Uh, we'll discuss this at the end. Uh, with his power, God creates all, all he wills, makes none, uh, makes non-existent whatever he wills, and there is nothing that limits God's power. Uh, the rational argument for this is, had God not been powerful, he would be incapable. 
And if he were weak and incapable, then the world could not be created without a powerful God that could do so. Uh, the symmetry and precision in the universe is a reflection of its uh, source derived from God's power. So the question one might ask is, can God have the power to become incapacitated, become uh, mortal since he is all powerful? al re uh, responds to this saying, that which is impossible for God is that which limits his power like death, finitude, blindness, incapacity, mort and mortality. Um, this also includes the desire to become deficient. From God's power is that he is transcendent above, willing that which is impossible for divinity, that which limits God. In other words, if it were possible for God to die or become incapacitated, he would not be a God to begin with. God is thus a fault, flaw, shortcoming, evolution, or trait that is unbefitting of his divinity. Uh, the eternality of, of these attributes of God's affirmative attributes, such as power, will, et cetera, also means that these attributes cannot cease to exist. God cannot be powerful today and as tomorrow. Um, you might say, well, isn't this limiting God? N not if you think in the way that a negative of a negative equals a positive. So these are negations of limiting attributes. These are negations of negatives. So anything that limits God is impossible because that, is, uh, uh, that itself is a negative uh, way of describing what is the uh, necessary existence. So if God is and is all power and is necessary for that God, for there to be a God for everything else to come into being, then that God have uh, negating attributes, it cannot have um, limits or deficiencies such as powerlessness, such as weakness, such as a lack of knowledge, etc. Uh, we see this in the Quran, to God belongs all that is in the earth, whether you show what is in your minds or conceal it, God calls you to account. He forgives whom he pleases and punishes whom he pleases, for God has power over all things. So our, our focus here is, Wallahu ala kulli shay'in qadir. And this is the attribute of qudra that we're talking about here. Wallahu ala kulli shay'in qadir. The eighth affirmative attribute is will, will or irada. And this is eternal to God's essence, qa'in bidatihi. His will, uh, his will is applied to that which is uh, possible and not that which is impossible through its negation of divine attributes, such as power, sight, existence, beginninglessness, endlessness, etc. Uh, so God is, does not will to be dead. God does not will to cease to exist because uh, within that uh, statement is a contradiction. It's like saying that is a married bachelor. Uh, we've defined God as the necessary existent. For the necessary existent to be the necessary existent, it has to have power, it has to have it can't be dependent upon anything else, et cetera, et cetera. Therefore, um, anything, uh, the, even the idea of a limitation on God's power is itself um, a logical fallacy. God's will means that if he wills a thing, it happens, creation, existence, events, et cetera. Uh, the rational argument for this is if God did not have supreme that he is the selector and one who chooses all things, God will be incapable. He will be weak, uh, which means he is limited. One who lacks supreme power cannot be the source of all existence and all other powers which are contingent upon God's will, power, and knowledge. 
So again, this is, as I mentioned, it's a logical fallacy for a God that's weak or for a God that doesn't have knowledge because uh, that is then not God, not God within the way Muslims understand God as the necessary existent who is all powerful. Um, you can't have a bachelor because in that in itself is a logical fallacy, just as you can't have a uh, incapacitated God or a God that is dead or a God that does not um, have knowledge and power and will. He is fa'alun lima yurid. This is another part of the Quran that makes reference to the sifa of irada. The ninth affirmative attribute is knowledge, ilm, and it is qa'im bidatihi, eternal. It's an eternal attribute of God's. His attribute of knowledge means that God knows all things in detail and pre-eternally. He is transcendent over knowing something after ignorance. This is a logical impossibility of God's divinity. Um, God's knowledge is unlike human knowledge, which is originated, acquired, limited, uh, human knowledge is prone to illusion, etc. So God's knowledge is not like any of this. Um, God's knowledge is also pre-eternal with his essence. So he knows all that was, is, and God's knowledge is not limited by time. Because remember, we said God created time. Therefore, God exists before time exists. Therefore, uh, there is no limitation on God in terms of time. Anything that attempts to describe God in terms of time and becomes a logical fallacy. We see this in uh, Ayat al-Kursi, Allahu la ilaha illa huwa al-hayyu al-qayyu. La ta'khuduhu stinatun wa la no, et cetera. So you could see this. He knows what appears, ya'lamu ma bayna aydihim wa ma khalfahum. He knows what appears to his creatures as before or or behind them. يَعْلَمُ مَا بَيْنَ أَيْدِيهِمْ وَمَا خَلْفَهُمْ So this is where the attribute of ilm is seen in the Qur'an. The tenth attribute is hayat. It's also that is, um, uh, exists eternally in God's essence. The rational argument is if God created all then he must also be living. The dead cannot create the living. So God has to be living <laughs> logically in order for life to come from God. We also in the verse of the throne, Allahu la ilaha illa huwal hayyun qayyum. So hayyun qayyum is the, hay is the uh, attribute here that is life. We also see from this, uh, the attribute of sama, of hearing, and it's an eternal attribute with his essence, qa'im bidatihi. He hears all sounds as they are without fault, flaw, or imperfection. God's hearing differs from human hearing in that God does not require a limb to hear as human do, humans do. God doesn't need to have an ear. God is not, uh, God's hearing is not limited by time, space, volume, as human hearing is. Uh, and the scriptural source for this is, and he is all hearing and the all seeing. This is in Surah Al-Baqarah. The affirmative attribute uh, of sight, Basar, is number 12. So uh, God sees all things exactly as they are. God's seeing is different from human seeing in the same way he differs. God's sight does not require eyes. He doesn't require a limb. It is not limited by time, space, or volume. Scriptural source, he is the all-hearing, the all-seeing. So this is the same verse we saw earlier. And uh, number 13 is God's speech, kalam. And this is qa'im bidatihi, eternal attribute of God's essence. God's speech is unlike human speech. God's speech has no sounds, words, or letters. God's speech is pre-eternal, does not get detached from him the way when I say a word, it gets detached from my mouth and 
make sound waves and you all hear it in your ears. That's not how God's speech uh, works. So God's speech is pre-eternal. It does not get detached from him when it is conveyed to the hearts of humans. It is speech that is internal and without letters and sound. So this is what's meant by uncreated speech. This is considered by the Ash'aris and the Maturidis to be the uncreated speech of God. When it takes the form of words, recitation, written texts, audible sounds, this is considered to be created. This differs from the Marthazila, who believe that there is no speech outside of words, sounds, and letters. And it also differs from uh, some of the Hanabila, the Ahlul Hadith, who take literally any word uh, 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 that is an utterance of the Quran to be uncreated. So that's a, those are two positions, but neither are mainstream uh, positions. Uh, the speech of God is referenced in the scripture and Quran itself. So we see and we sent messengers we have mentioned to you before and messengers we have not mentioned to you. And to Musa, God addressed his word speaking to him. Ghazali comments on the saying that Musa heard the speech of God, kalam nafsi, without sounds or letters. Just like the righteous will see God in the hereafter without form or size. The Maturidis add a 14th um, attribute, and this is the attribute of tekwin, which means bringing into being. Uh, it comes from the Quranic verse, kun fayakun, when, God is, uh, when the angel Gabriel is speaking to Mary in the Quran. She said, O Lord, how shall I have a son when no man has touched me? He said, so it will be, for God creates what he wills. When he has decreed something, he says to it, only be, and it is, kun fayakun. Uh, Maturidis say that bringing things into being is a separate attribute of God, while the Ash'aris hold that bringing into being is an action, which is, including, which is already included within the attribute of divine power. So this is a um, difference of opinion between two Sunni, um, mainstream Sunni schools of theology. Um, by Creating taqween as a separate attribute, it also avoids the Aristotelian argument that the universe is um, eternal through its eternal creation over and over. Uh, Maturidis say that God's attribute of bringing into being is eternal, but that which is brought into being is created. So the universe is created. God brings, uh, God's attribute of bringing things into being is eternal, but what he brings into being is contingent, it's created. Okay, so this is the, um, this, what we've gone over, this would be in a nutshell, the foundational uh, studies that you would go through if you were studying the Ilahiyat section of a Sunni book of theology. Uh, now I'm going to go into a little bit of debates and differences of opinions, and some of this might be um, a bit complicated. So some of you might say, "I really don't need, um, I don't need to hear all of this." So you can maybe um, take a 10-minute break and come back for questions. Um, otherwise, uh, uh, we'll go through these arguments back and forth and. Um, you know, some of this is complicated, and if it's if it's um, if it's a bit complicated, don't worry about it. We can discuss it in the questions, but it's really not. Um, this part is um, optional uh, in 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 looking at this whole topic. So, what are some of the ob objections to the divine attributes? So you have uh, the modern Salafi objection. So modern Salafis accuse Ash'aris and Maturidis of seven or eight different segments of God. Um, Ash'aris and Maturidis distinguish between the Sifat al-Ma'ani, which we say the affirmative attributes, knowledge, in basar sight, hayat, life, sama, hearing, irada, will, power, and uh, 
beginninglessness, uh, and the al ma'nawi, which is the 90 names of God, so Ar Rahman, Ar Rahim, Al Ghani, etc. So Salafis do not object to the Sifat al ma'nawi, they don't object to the 99 names of God, they object to the Sifat al ma'ani because they argue. They say that the latter has to do with the essence of God. The Mu'tazilite argument is far more sophisticated in that it, um, there's some overlap there, but they argue they have additional arguments based on this. So the Mu'tazilite and the Dhaniya debate as to whether God's attributes are God himself or separate from God. This is known as Ainuhu or Ghayruhu. So Muslim peripatetic philosophers held that God has an essence of that and does not need any additional attribute to his essence. And the Mu'tazilites held a view that was close to this with the philosophers. They say that there is no attribute distinct from God's essence. So God sees with his essence. God wills with his essence. God hears with his essence. They do not accept the framing God knows with his knowledge. God hears with his attribute of hearing. Because they say this describes another entity that is infinite and parallel to God. So these are the two objections. Um, uh, the Mu'tazilite take this further, and they say that uh, these attributes resemble the hypostasis or the uknum or parts of the Trinity. Uh, the Mu'tazilites are concerned, saying that uh, people, once you start using these attributes, qadim, beginninglessness, uh, power, qudra, etc., each are eternal separate existences, thus making a number of existences multiplied, which they say resemble the uknum or parts of the Trinity. Uh, the Mu'tazilites further argued that the Christians gradually changed the attribute of life, knowledge, and existence into separate parts that were eternal in the form of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. And the Mu'tazilites argued that Muslims can fall into the same paradigm if they describe God's attributes in a way that is distinct from God. And if you recall from our first uh, uh, discussion last week, the Mu'tazilites were really uh, the first to engage in debates and dialogues with um, the early Christian community. And so uh, how to respond to the Trinity, how to engage the Trinity was really something that the Mu'tazilites were concerned about. So what are Shari and Matthew response to these objections? The uh, Asharis and the Maturidis in a nutshell say that God's attributes are neither identical with God nor are they separate from God's essence. La aynuhu wa la ghayruhu. So you'll see this phrase come up a lot in texts of theology. And they say this since there is nothing that is separate that is being described then multiplicity of gods is not implied. So power is not a separate entity from God. It's neither separate nor is it identical. They argue that one cannot say that God wills, but he doesn't have a will. God is powerful, but God does not have power. Or God hears, but he doesn't have the attribute of hearing. God is living, sure, but God does not have the attribute of life. They say this is just a logical fallacy. This makes no sense. Um, furthermore, the problem with saying that all of these are and God's essence, as the Mu'tazilites say, as the Salafis say, is that there is no distinction between God's knowledge, God's power, and thus uh, they cannot be the same as God's essence. Why does this matter? The fact that God's knowledge and power is separate means that God's power to act is separate from his knowledge of events, which is separate from his will for events to happen. This has an implication in how we discuss the Odyssey. So of course, everything that happens in the world happens under the umbrella or the framework of the will of God. However, um, when people sin or when people do something wrong, 
is it God that makes them do this since he knows that they're going to sin? Does that also mean that God has the power to stop them, but he doesn't? Or does it mean that God's knowledge means that God is um, uh, forcing or making the people who are sinning sin? If that's the case, then how can God be a just God and judge people for doing wrong if humans don't have the free choice to do what is right and what is wrong? This we're going to talk about in the uh, upcoming week, the theodicy uh, section. However, the distinction, distinguishing between God's power and God's will and God's knowledge is essential and key to be able to make other arguments and discussions about, um, well, if God is all just, if God is fair, if God is good, why do all of these terrible things happen in the world? If God knows that this tragedy is going to happen, does that mean that God made the tragedy happen? You know, so these types of questions really, um, to be able to discuss these questions on a sophisticated level, it has to be able to separate between God's knowledge, God's power, and God's uh, will. The Maturidis also respond that the Atru and the Asharis, uh, the, the Sunni response to these criticisms is uh, the attribute also cannot be separate from God's essence. This would mean multiplicity. So remember, we said they respond to the saying that it is la la The attributes are neither identical nor separate from God's essence. One might ask, uh, is it not contradictory to say something is neither identical nor different, one or the other? So, I mean, how can you say that this phone is neither, the pen and the phone are neither identical, nor are they separate? Theologians say that, yes, when it comes to things that are tangible, that, it, that argument holds. So you can't say a pen and a phone that you see in front of you right here, these are neither identical nor they separate because they're tangible. They are tangible existences. They have what's known as wujud khariji, and they are uh, khariji, uh, they're khariji ghair. So they are an external uh, otherness, whereas there is uh, there is a mafhumi ghair. There is an intangible difference that's understood in the minds. Uh, it's inseparable in the, uh, it's different in the mind, but it doesn't exist physically. It doesn't exist tangibly. So um, we might also use this term, uh, so something that exists in the mind, but doesn't exist tangibly in the world, is, has a wujud dhihni. Um, and these are differences that he recognizes, but they do not exist in the material world. And this is opposed to wujud khariji, which is an external existence, which then has physical separability. So the parts of the Trinity have physical separability. Jesus, the man, separates from the Trinity. He uh, uh, has a physical outward existence. This is not the same as power, which does not have an outward physical existence. So let's look at this here. So when we think about an external existence, wujud khariji, we say this book must be the same as my pencil or something different from it. Since the book is not the pencil, it must be different. So, or the phone and the pencil either are the same or they're different. Since the pencil is not the phone, they must be different. In this case, the objection that it must be one or the other, but not both, is valid because we're talking about tangibles. The attributes of God are not tangibles. Uh, Kalam theologians are saying that the attributes of God are not tangible external differences. They're not khariji right? They're not external differences because they do not have an external existence. So when they say la ghayruhu, that the attributes are not outside of God's essence, they are referring to a tangible external existence. They are outside of God's essence in terms of 
human understanding, but not in terms of physical existence. Um, so God's attributes are not separable. Ma yenfek anishay. So you'll see this in theology texts. Uh, Sunni Kalam theologians argue this is different from the Trinity because Jesus, for example, has the attribute of separability through incarnation on earth. Therefore, their argument regarding the differences between the attributes and the parts of the Trinity is that there is an external tangible and separate existence to the parts of the Trinity in the form of the human Jesus incarnate, which the attributes of God, such as knowledge, power, life, do not have. Uh, so when uh, Sunni Kalam theologians say la gayruhu, that attributes are neither one with God's essence nor outside of it, they are referring to the external tangible gayriya kharijiya, not intelligible separateness, not separateness in the mind. So you think in your mind, you'll separate will, power, etc., but they don't have a tangible existence. Uh, which is that exists in him, but not actually. Uh, can we think of an attribute existing independently of its possession? So can power and knowledge be found walking on the ground or operating in a way independently from the divine source, which these attributes are describing? Say um, you look at this pen and you say this pen is black. Can black separate from the pen and exist and float around the room in a way that is separate from this pen, it can't. Because blackness exists uh, along, it exists through the penness, through the pen. Um, the same way power does not exist by itself, one is a possessor of power. Uh, life doesn't exist in itself. Something, a thing is a possessor. It, it exists through something. This brings us to another issue, which is the eternality of the divine attributes. So Kalam theologians add that the condition of divine attributes is that they are eternal, qadim or ezeli, and that they're not temporal or something that came about later on. Uh, if they say, uh, if they had not been eternal, when we say God is living, uh, and he has the attribute of life, it would mean there was a time when God was not living. Uh, similarly, if we said the attribute of knowledge is temporal, it came about later and it's not eternal, then it would mean that there was a time when God did not know things. Or power, there was a time when God was not powerful, there was a time when God did not see or hear, et cetera. So all of these are logical possibilities. So God's attributes must be uh, eternal with they they are eternal through God. A sect called the Kadramiya claimed that uh, uh, God's attributes came about later in time and that they are had so this word had temporal something that comes about later in time. So the Kadramiya claimed that God's attributes came later in time. Uh, the Sunni theologians responded to this saying that an entity that is eternal must also have eternal attributes. Similarly, an entity that is temporal must also have temporal attributes. You can't mix and match. If this pen was created and its attribute is that it has color, you cannot, the color cannot exist before the pen exists. Um, and what does it mean attribute to exist through its essence? We saw this uh, uh, through each of the attributes I mentioned, the uh, affirmative attributes. It is the attribute that when it is present with an essence of a thing, it distinguishes that thing. So a cat, uh, so, so a cat has a certain, catness that cat a cat it's a mahia however what makes one cat different from another cat or a pen different from another pen or a phone different from another phone is its size its color its type 
that are specific to that cat as opposed to another cat. So the cat's color and size are not separately existing entities that can be separated from the cat or exist independently without the cat. So so God's attributes are not separated from God, like the parts of the Trinity, like Jesus can be separated from the Trinity, nor can they exist independently without God, because they are caught in bidati. They exist through God's essence. So the blackness of this pen exists through the pen, the penness. You cannot separate the black from the pen and have a pen here and black here. Black is it's uh, the attribute of the pen. And I believe this slide, again, I said this would be a little bit complicated. So can another logical problem with the assumption of God's attribute being temporal rather than eternal is that it would mean that God's essence, which is eternal, Ezali and Qadim underwent change through later acquiring certain attributes. Well, what's the problem with this? This is a rational impossibility because remember we said that God is not limited by time. God exists before time exists. Therefore, God created time and any attribution of time to God is anachronistic and a logical fallacy. So um, this is a rational impossibility because it would mean that that which is eternal underwent change over time through acquiring the attributes of knowledge, power, will, etc. But the definition of eternality is that which is eternal, uh, that which is eternal is beyond limits of time and space. To say divine attributes are temporal creates a time frame for an eternal existent God, which is beyond. So this is what I summarized earlier. God created time. So you can't say that an attribute came about in a, par, par, in a period of time when we're talking about that which is beyond time, which is God. Um, yeah, so in other words, they're saying God existed before time existed through his eternality and temporality, which came into existence through God's bringing... Therefore, he cannot be limited by time. Similarly, God existed before space existed, can't be limited by space, by form, etc. And this is the end of our discussion. And remember, all of this goes back to our initial argument on wajib and wujud. So, um, let me just go over that one more time in case some of you came late. So the wajib al-wujud, existence number one, what brought it into existence? Existence number two, what brought that into existence? Existence number three, okay, well, what brought that ex into existence? Number four, okay, how did that come about? Number five, how did that come about? We can't keep going forever. So there has to be an existence that is not dependent on any other existence to exist in and of itself. And this is necessary existence, wajib al wujud. And this is really the foundation from which all of these other theological uh, discussions and attributes are. Uh, highlighted or they are uh, uh, in further detail. So I hope this was clear and um, I hope it wasn't super confusing. If the some of the arguments at the end were confusing, I would like you to be at least exposed to them and hear different perspectives, uh, even if um, not everybody may be interested into the uh, may be interested in the uh, debates around them. Thank you so much, Dr. Furial, um, for, uh, I'm surprised how much you were able to pack in um, with respect to uh, the, 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 the divine attributes and, and, and so many of the complexities and the nuances that uh, I think so many people may not be so familiar with. I think a lot of times we're fairly familiar on the surface level with the Asma'il Husna uh, and the 99 names, but to see 
the, the debates behind those, is the, with, especially within uh, Islamic circles of uh, whether some of them are even valid. Is it, is it, is it valid to extend certain attributes and uh, what, what constitutes that? So this was very much very insightful for me. And we've got some questions that were coming in. So again, just as a reminder to folks, please feel free to drop your questions into uh, the chat um, and uh, we can we can call on there. We've got some in the queue already. So uh, I'll go ahead uh, and ask them. And Dr. Ferriel, as, as you'll see, um, some of them you'll see in the main chat, but I've got some that people had sent me beforehand. So the first question that I got sent here was, um, I understand the differences in describing God's attributes being not identical, uh, but not different from his essence, and that they are not temporal. But can you elaborate on the difference of the Maturidi and the Ashari debate versus the Salafi approach? The debate over what? Um, the just, attributes? I, I, I believe, um, and uh, let me see if there's any clarification. It, yeah, and in God's attributes, yeah. Um, I wonder if that person may have come in late, because uh, I did discuss them in the slides at the very end. So, I mean, they're really involved. I'd have to go through each of them again. So, uh, but there, I did, I have them in detail in the slide. I, you understand that the, it's such a complicated, uh, it's not something you can explain in two or three sentences. So um, there are several slides there that outline those differences. Yeah, no, of course. Um, and then we, as, as, as uh, mentioned at the beginning, um, this uh, recording will be available for folks in its entirety, um, just actually within a few hours of uh, the, the closing of uh, our session here, inshallah. So it'll be on our YouTube channel. So that'll all be there with Dr. Ferial's slides and uh, and everything. So y'all are welcome to check that out. And this is part of a series. So we'll continue the conversation. So those questions that might linger can be asked here. Um, the second question I got here, I think this was also more specific to something mentioned uh, in the uh, slides as well, but it was asking for further elaboration. Um, can you describe more about the Ahle Hadith uh, saying with respect to uh, the speech slash Kalam attribute uh, and how attributes and how that might affect their personal practice? Um, so the Ahlul Hadith are much more literal and they don't go into these rational discussions that, we, that we've gone over. And, um, you know, that works for some people. Uh, for example, the verses in the Quran that are, uh, that some worry or sound anthropomorphic like Yadullahi Fauqa Aidihim. They say we believe in it bila kaif. And this was actually the initial position of Imam al Ash'ari and the Ash'ari school evolved from there. Um, those who choose to uh, um, uh, use more reason and rational uh, thought in thinking about God really. Um, tended to also come from regions where there was a lot of diversity and there were different ideas and to be able to engage different you really need to be able to um, think in a diverse way so or to be able to think rationally and engage in rational arguments to be able to engage people who may not agree uh, with one's own uh, perspective and so uh uh, the the uh, Athari, the Ahlul Hadith view is that everything is uncreated, including the words that come out from one's, uh, when one recites the Quran, but um, that's not a mainstream Sunni view. That's, it's, a, it's a misconception. So the mainstream Sunni view is that uh, once one utters them, that's created. The book as the Quran created, but God's speech that is unlike human speech is uncreated. Thanks so much for answering that, uh, Dr. Ferial. Uh, the, the next question I think may um, speak to this in a little bit, uh, but also expand uh, the conversation uh, here. Uh, Dr. Bodman uh, has uh, put in the chat that, will you also be discussing uh, Sheikh Al-Akbar uh, Ibn Arabi? Um, is his view uh, significant to the broader discussion of Sunni theology, or is it too peripheral? Uh, 
I'm actually not um, uh, an expert on Ekberian theology, so I don't know. I haven't. Um, perhaps that's something that you could tell us about. If he, if he is there. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm here. Um, I think it may be um, uh, too peripheral or too, um, uh, it's its whole system. And um, so I'm not sure whether that's worth the time, but basically is the idea that the um, everything that exists partakes of portions of the attributes. And he kind of has concentric circles like rays going out. And the further away you get from God um, in that, in uh, representing only one attribute, then that is where evil comes from. Mm -hmm. So if I um, represent only the attribute of justice, but have no mercy, you know, then that becomes evil, even though justice is a good thing. Um, yeah. So, so it gets very, uh, it's a fascinating um, cosmology and uh, ethic, but um, uh, it is it is complex. But I'm what I don't know is whether mainstream uh, Ashari uh, theology. I know they refute some parts of it, but whether it's had influence over the over the ages, or whether it has remained something that. Um, that few people pay any attention to, except groupies like me. Huh. Yeah, I actually don't know. I'm not a Akbarian. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, this is something I'm curious about to research further, but I don't know the answer to that question. Okay. Thank you for your explanation. Well, it sounds like even what you just said says that Aquarian theology um, hasn't really filtered in much. So in your research, and, and it's a very impressive um, that you don't find places where this comes from Ibn Arabi and um, it just doesn't arise. So that that's, says a lot of what I want to know. Yeah, I'm not aware of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. thanks. Thanks so much for the question, uh, Dr. Bob, I appreciate it. Uh, another question we have here, uh, Dr. Salem, is um, is this, uh, I believe uh, the debate that we were referencing earlier um, that was in the slides concerning the uh, Maturidi and uh, Ashari um, views on, on the divine attributes um, was also a question related to it that, is this debate related to the discussion as to whether the Quran is created or uncreated, or is that a separate uh, issue in light altogether? Um, perhaps uh, in a way, in the way God's speech is looked at. And so the, uh, mainstream Sunni position that the actual the utterances, what we hear of the Quran is created, but God's speech is, uh, is unlike human speech and that that is eternal. Uh, this would be a point of um, discussion or debate between the Mu'tazilites and the, uh, the Sunnis, the Ash'aris. Um, but the Ash'aris and the Maturidis, I don't think they would have really developed their uh, thinking on this uh, during the Mehna. They wouldn't have because that would be anachronistic. This would have really developed later in time. And um, over time, historically, we know from, uh, and I talked about in my other lecture last week, that the Mu'tazilites begin as Hanafis. So the Mu'tazilites are mostly Hanafis in Baghdad. And with time, the Hanafis adopt either mostly Maturidi, but they adopt uh, uh, Sunni theology in the form of Ash'ari and Maturidi. And the Mu'tazilite theology later in time uh, gets taken up by the Shia. Uh, 
And this might be a discussion between Ottoman and Safavid scholars later on, but um, when the mahna was happening, the mahna of the createdness or uncreatedness of the Quran, these were not uh, uh, these were not topics that were developed in a sophisticated way at the time in Ashari theology. I mean, Imam Ashari comes a century later, even. I've heard the answer there, and then uh, another question we have here. Um, uh, discusses this aspect that uh, did pure knowledge, did classical theologians discuss the contingent nature of the Quran itself uh, in a similarity uh, with the Christian held view of how Jesus is the word of God and divine? Yeah, so there is this debate about in liberation. Um, I don't remember it off the top of my head, but yes, so there are uh, discussions on that and I'd have to go back and uh, look it over again. So this is in liberation. This is, this was a Christian argument that um, some of the early Christians debating the Maratazilites argued. Well, Jesus is the uh, word of God, uh, as the and uh, we worship as the way you believe the Quran is um, divine in the, in that way. So, uh, but I'd have to look at that closer. Of course, of course, thank you. Um, and uh, again, just a reminder to folks, um, as we uh, come towards uh, the end of our discussion, we still have some time for questions. So uh, feel free to populate the, the chat, um, or if you'd like to ask your question um, off uh, mic or off camera, uh, just raise your hand and I'm happy to call on you and um, we can have uh, you come on stage here. Um, and in the meanwhile, uh, Dr. Fairley, I'm very curious that for folks that uh, may not uh, be as privy to uh, a lot of the nuances or the depth of Islamic theology uh, for many of the lay uh, Muslims and lay practitioners. Um, how, uh, for, for you and, and, and in your research, um, what are some kind of practical ways to approach understanding Islamic theology beyond just the uh, beyond just the, the text of the Quran, beyond like the tafsir that's there and beyond just uh, the very uh, common recitation of the Ismail Husna? How, how can the common uh, uh, Muslim kind of approach this in a way that may not be so overwhelming in different attributes and the, the, the debates and all that, and just to be able to develop the, the nuances of how classical Islam uh, viewed uh, and still views, in a sense, um, a law in these different nuances. Yeah. So if you remember, I started my talk with I started with just basics, but um, I started my talk with the attributes. And this, if one is studying Islamic theology um, from a faith-based perspective, from within a uh, Muslim, say, seminary or whatever, a faith-based perspective, they will study the attributes. And then I said, okay, this is going to get a little bit academic and it's going to be a little bit more um, sophisticated or complicated even. Um, you don't have to stick around. You could take a 10-minute break. You don't have to um, follow this, uh, this debate uh, so there was a part of this that was academic, but it doesn't mean that if one, a Muslim wants to study theology that they would have to engage in all of these arguments. I just wanted to um, uh, make that available in a nutshell and I just summarized them for those who might be interested in the different debates and things that uh, you might hear. Um, but really uh, you study a theology class, um, a aqidah class. So aqidah, if you take a aqidah class with somebody, uh, a Muslim, they would go over the attributes and probably not do it in just one hour. They would take uh, several weeks to go over it and it wouldn't be overwhelming. I, I remember uh, from my perspective as a Muslim, observant Muslim from a, a person of faith, when I studied, um, theology for the first time as a college student, it really strengthened my faith because I think uh, from my perspective or my experience, being able to speak uh, about faith in a reasoned way, in a rational way, being able to understand rationally why uh, we believe in God and all of these things just really enriched and strengthened my faith rather than, um, than the opposite. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I thank you so much for, for sharing that because I feel that, uh, you know, in, in looking at just the breadth of scholarship on this, but also the, how, how far um, you know, theologians uh, delve into this, just showing um, how each of them, uh, you know, feel impacted and view God in a sense, you know, that, that, that this isn't coming out from necessarily a polemical uh, viewpoint. A lot of this has become how they view, how they view God and how, uh, you know, they interact with God, how they see Allah. Uh, and I think just as you stated very beautifully that uh, it is really faith inspiring because you see how uh, each of these people view uh, Allah and whether in different uh, lights or just have these different conceptions overlapping all sorts um, and just give us uh, that that notion that what, what we think to Allah, what we might have in confines, there's so much more just even within the human uh, understanding. And then there's also just that divine uh, knowing that's eternal and beyond all reason. Uh, but just to be able to see that, I think was really uh, great to be able to glean that from your, your presentation is just the, the diversity, even within the Islamic thought of um, who Allah is uh, beyond just what we may know in the common frameworks. And then what doors does that open there? Um, and I see uh, Dr. Bodman's back on stage here with a hand up. So Wit, please feel free to uh, take it away. Yeah, uh, favorite topic of mine is uh, beauty, uh, Ihsan, and it's not in most lists and in normal um, what you see of the Safat uh, included, um, yet the names, the 99 names uh, are called beautiful, and I was wondering where beauty fits in, and this, you know, it's clearly God is described as beautiful. And a famous hadith he is, and um, and, um, and that's in the Quran. So I'm wondering where beauty fits in. Hmm. That's a great question. Um, beauty fits in holistically within all of these different fields that come together. So kalam really exercises the mind. So, you know, some of you might feel like you really got a brain exercise today, especially with fasting. Um, but that's that's how the field is. It really stretches the mind um, and it focuses on how do we, why do we believe God exists? If I were speaking with an atheist, what might be arguments or um, things that we could agree on? What might be different ways that we might be able to engage the topic of God if I'm speaking with somebody that is, does not believe in God, for example, altogether? So Kalam is really engaging the mind. Fiqh focuses a lot on the outer aspects of practice. And then you have Ihsan, which goes into the fields of tasawwuf or uh, tezkiya, different fields that really focus on uh, being a good person from within, spirituality, ethics, uh, beauty, these types of things. And they're meant to work together and not be uh, separated in and of themselves. So, um, you know, I'm not sure that in studying kalam, you'd be really if that was all that one was doing, that that would be, um, um, you know, aesthetics would be a big part of that. But there are other, you know, if one is in a madrasa or a seminary, that would be one of a part of a holistic curriculum that includes other topics that uh, focus on beauty. So they, when they are uh, discussing the, um, Asmaul Husna, never ask why they're Husna. Uh, I see what you're saying. So the beautiful names of God. Um, well, I mean, they're beautiful in when you hear them, they're melodic. People have made poems, right. people have written calligraphy, made them beautiful. Um, they describe God in beautiful ways. And, you know, uh, Muslims believe that God is beautiful. He loves beauty and anything that describes that which is beautiful is by default beautiful. And so, um, you know, these are uh, the beautiful names of God and perhaps in that way. Uh, but I, I was thinking as a theologian when you asked me that question, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
for Thank your you. question. We appreciate it. Um, and if anybody else has any other questions, um, like I said in the chat, uh, you are welcome to drop them there in the last five minutes that we have, uh, inshallah, uh, or you can come off mic uh, if there's any questions there. Um, uh, one question for uh, you uh, real quick, Dr. Faryal, is there, uh, if there's one kind of uh, main point you would like uh, to kind of hammer home for everybody to take away from this, whether they're on fasting brains, whether they are uh, operating just at, at full speed and ready to dive into this. Um, what, what for a student of knowledge that wants to pursue this more, what's kind of one uh, main takeaway that you feel uh, would, would be essential um, uh, with respect to the breadth of this field, the diversity of this deep topic and field uh, that is of uh, Kalam or of Islamic theology in specific with respect to monotheism and the divine attributes? Um, I would say that there's really a connection between the mind and the heart. And the more that one understands what they believe in, I've seen in my experience, the deeper, the more grounded one's faith becomes. So don't be afraid to think and ask rational questions. And, and um, there's nothing, as you've seen, I mean, we've gone through just, we've just scratched the surface of some of these issues. There's nothing that Muslims did not ask or think that is beyond, um, uh, debate or discussion, everything about why exists, how does God exist, what is his nature, all of these things were discussed. And, um, you know, we live in a time where um, it's uncommon or unlikely person to live in a isolated uh, environment in which they're not engaging in, in these types of Questions. So I, I think that reasoned faith, that faith in which uh, reason is engaged, really um, has a positive impact on the soul. Uh, I would pick a teacher, pick a scholar, pick a class, and just study aqidah. It's actually not as complicated. I'm sorry if I made it sound really seem really complicated, but I tried oh. to give you guys a, a summary in one hour. But the, you, if you study the aqidah class, you might go over one attribute in one hour. Absolutely. No, no, no. And, and, and it was absolutely uh, clear. We see the amin to that. Um, and uh, one question that's just come here is that, uh, what is the spirit of God that uh, Quran, uh, uh, of God uh, that's mentioned in the Quran that breathes into man? Um, how is this understood in the context of the essence of God? Ah, that's a good question. I actually don't know off the top of my head. I'd have to look it up. I'd have to research it. Sure, sure, no worries. And we, we've got you for a couple more halakhas, inshallah. We can, well, well, we can see you then. Um, and then uh, this last one here before we close out um, was mentioned that uh, uh, it's, it's reassuring to see, um, you know, the uh, diving into rationalism, but also all these different topics to ask questions about the essence of God. Um, but oftentimes I find uh, we are limited in our community settings that are uh, dictated by certain views of how God is or what God is, what is God, what God is not. Um, uh, apart from maybe taking an Akida course, are there other spaces that you feel are conducive to have these conversations without being labeled, um, you know, as a heretic for just asking certain questions of theology? Yeah. So, I mean, that was part of my um motivation and including that last section where I gave you different perspectives and different debates in that you might hear one particular view that's not a mainstream Sunni view to say that, oh, well, you know, our, this is like the Trinity, the attributes of God, et cetera. So I wanted you all to know that there is, um, these are sophisticated discussions and people who did uh, discuss Islamic theology, and they did discuss the attributes of God, had really sophisticated uh, ways of thinking. It's not like, you know, you and I, we just came up with this and nobody thought of it, these questions before we did. And the more you know, I think knowledge gives a person confidence. The more a person, uh, the wider their breadth of um, knowledge of Islamic thought, Islamic tradition is, the more comfortable they are in responding to individuals who may attempt to impose um, cer certain limiting 
perspectives on, on a community. So I would say learn, study, read. Um, that'll give you so much confidence. It'll give you ammunition to respond. Um, you'll just laugh it off and just say, wow, you guys really <laughs> don't know what you're talking about. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Perea. Um, I want to offer up just this last opportunity here as well. Our next uh, next um, uh, session, inshallah, in the series will cover um, tradition and leadership. Uh, Dr. Ferial, did you want to speak to that any um, as, as kind of a, a, a bit of a primer per se uh, for what folks can expect? And inshallah, we can then close out on that. So tradition and leadership is the idea of how do we know that the Islam we practice today is um, what the Prophet Muhammad uh, would have practiced. What would Muhammad do? People ask, what would Jesus do? What would Muhammad do? So I look at this through the lens of Sunni and Shia thought, and I go over differences and similarities between Sunni Islam and Shia Islam. And that's where tradition and leadership come into play. So we'll be learning about uh, dis differences between Sunnis and Shias. And just as today I gave you different perspectives, what they say, what they respond, what they say, we'll also see some of the debates between Sunnis and Shias. And you'll see that it's also more sophisticated than um, what's often presented. Well, we're definitely looking forward to it. And for everyone, uh, inshallah, next Sunday as well, 2 p.m. Central, 3 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time. Uh, bring your questions. This recording, again, will be available online as the previous recording as well. Uh, so if any questions come up, please feel free to uh, utilize our next two sessions, inshallah, for that. But thank you uh, all so much for being here and being a part of the conversation. And again, Dr. Ferial, a huge thank you. Jazak khair for being able to, I, I don't know how you're able to even condense all the, the topic of Islamic theology into uh, even scratching the surface so, so beautifully within these four weeks. Uh, already we've gotten so much uh, wealth of knowledge from you, and we're really looking forward to the next two sessions. But thank you so much for being here and uh, for continuing to uh, teach and be with us as we as we learn through this. Thank you for having me. It's really a pleasure to be with all of you. Absolutely. All right. Until next time, everyone. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alaikum assalam.